Can y'all hear me? All right. We're going to actually be taping it so we can use it and uh, to show some of our members that are not here and, and then maybe they may be using it later on in their own communities when they have meetings and so i want to say how much i appreciate you coming and we really don't have a quorum but that's fine because the fact we're not going to be voted on anything today anyway this is just an informational meeting i, I think in talking to the members of my committee one of the things that we feel a little bit short on is the fact that dca has so much to offer and and i think we just uh today we probably going to get a drink of water from a fire hydrant and that's fine but that's better than nothing at all and there may be some questions and and you know if there's enough interest and some other things that we don't cover maybe we'll come back and do that later so i want to welcome you today commissioner gretchen corbin and thank you and uh hope you're enjoying your new job now who you want to start off the agenda okay all right thank you be sure you get a microphone if you don't mind and pull up next to you one of those right there be fine actually you know this is unusual but uh, because the cameras in the back I'm gonna ask you to either sit right there or right here sort of the camera can catch you to the side if you don't mind Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, thank you very much for hosting the Department of Community Affairs today. Um, at the Department of Community Affairs, as you know, we're responsible for many things with local government. What I have found, I'm a new commissioner as of August, and I've found that there are 65 programs at the Department of Community Affairs. And so um, you think you have one thing, um, you know, down pat, and then you find another really great opportunity in front of you, and that's what our 65 programs are. Um, Today I have with me Mr. John Ellis, who is our Deputy Commissioner of Administration and Finance, and also Ms. Carmen Chubb, who is our Deputy Commissioner of Housing. Um, we, are, um, we are missing um, our Deputy Commissioner of Community and Economic Development fi and Finance, um, Mr. Brian Williamson, but we bring that information as well today. Um, so what I want to do is kind of give an opening of the Department of Community Affairs, and then I'm also going to pass it on to John and Carmen to discuss the programming, and we'll, but we'll all three be here for questions. Um, but as you know, we are the state's community development arm. We take very seriously that we have 65 programs that can be wrapped up in three different situations. And the first is local government assistance. The second is community and economic development finance. And the third is providing safe, I like to say providing the opportunity for, safe and affordable housing for every Georgian. And I say that, Carmen, because we provide that opportunity for safe and affordable housing. The Georgians have to want to desire and work for it in partnership with the government. Our customers, as you'll see on this PowerPoint, are our citizens the communities and businesses of Georgia. Um, as I mentioned, our three core operations and our 65 programs. This is so interesting to me, and you probably, this may be all, old news for all of you, but we have a $240 million annual budget. But 72% of that is federal. Only 22% of that is state. And the most interesting part of our state funding is that only um, that 83, excuse me, of, of our 22% of our state funding, 10% um, is are for operations. Is that correct? Do I have that exact? What is the exact number, John? Okay. But that is, that is of our annual budget, 83% passes through 70% of operations. I want to make it very clear that from our state budget dollars that come through, Again, only 22% of our budget. Of that 22%, um, what stays with us and what are passed through funds? Percent we use to meet our federal match requirements. And so, um, if you so for those those dollars, I ask y'all to please remember that when you see the state dollars to remember that um, that 83 percent is passing through so that's the thank thank you very much for the reba the one georgia dollars that are 
passing through were the financing arm for the state of Georgia to our local development authorities. Um, but that means those are not DCA operations when you see those state funds go there. Um, so we have 425 full-time employees, um, permanent employees. We have four regional offices. Um, our main headquarters is off North Druid Hills off of Interstate 85, and we would love all of you to join us there. And Chairman Pruitt, we would like to invite your committee to, to spend some time with us and for us to walk around the building and, and see what's going in there. Um, but we also have four regional offices. Um, we have um, a regional office in Athens um, that provides for housing assistance. Uh, th it also houses our downtown development, um, a part of our downtown development office in regards um, to design in Athens. Um, Tucker, Waycross, and Eastman also house our rental assistant division components. Um, and obviously we want those those offices throughout the state to assist our Georgians in housing. And then obviously we have multiple public and private partnerships. That's kind of who DCA is. And so um, at this point, I'm going to pass this over to, um, to Deputy um, Commissioner John Ellis to talk about our community and economic development programs. Um, he is very close to these programs, but as y'all all know, so am I. So um, if you do have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those with John, but I'll pass the floor over to John. Okay, before we do that, John, thank you very much for coming, but does anybody have any particular questions right now, the Commissioner, before we go to John? I don't want to. I, I don't want to get stoppy in the middle of the roll, but uh, please. Anytime. Okay. Very good, John. Thank you, members of the committee. So I'm going to tell you about a few of the community and economic development programs at DCA. The first one we have up there is our job tax credit program, which uh, are credits against the Georgia income tax. And you may have heard of the tier system uh, that counties are in. There are four different tiers. Uh, we rank uh, counties based on unemployment information, uh, poverty information, uh, and then based on the tier they're in determines the level of the tax credit they're eligible for for businesses locating in those counties. So we administer that program. Uh, we also, as the commissioner was just mentioning, uh, administer many of what's thought of as the incentive programs, uh, the One Georgia program. We do all of what we call the back office work for the One Georgia programs, including our EDGE and equity program. Uh, the equity program is really geared towards capacity building in our rural communities, getting communities ready uh, and prepared for economic growth. And then our EDGE are what we call our deal closing funds. And we work very closely with the Department of Economic Development for, for those. One Georgia has uh, an annual appropriation of around 20 million a year. The past couple of years that's been our funding level. Um, and initially when One Georgia was created it was funded with the tobacco settlement funds. Mm -hmm. In the past several years we've actually been funded in One Georgia through state general funds. And those tobacco settlement monies have gone to uh, other agencies within I, the state budget. May I interrupt? Sure. You said in the last few years it's been funded at $20 million. Yes, sir. What has it been in the past? Uh, and initially it was $47 million a year. Uh, that's when we were getting funds through the tobacco settlement agreement. The state of Georgia got around $150 million a year through that, and one Georgia's piece was close to $50 million of that $150 million. I believe I'm right that the, one, that the tobacco funds are starting to fade away in the next few years. Is that right? We're about 15 years into a 25-year okay. um, settlement, and then there, there is a provision that that can be renegotiated at the end of that time. Okay. Uh, and then uh, another one of what we call our incentive or deal closing programs, uh, you'll heard called REBA, which stands for the Regional Economic Business Assistance Program. And these, again, are deal closing monies. It's usually when there is a competitive situation. So we're trying to get a company that might also be uh, courted by Florida or South Carolina or North Carolina. Uh, and these are funds we make available to try to bring those jobs to Georgia. 
and the most recent appropriation for REBA was also at the $20 million uh, level. And just some perspective on that, in the last five years, I'll take REBA as an example. Uh, we've made 40 awards, over $25 million, and creating almost 9,000 jobs uh, through the REBA program. In One Georgia, that EDGE project that I talked about that is deal closing the last five years, 68 awards, uh, totaling over $100 million and creating over 14,000 jobs. John, do you mind sharing some examples? Sure. This is where I'll look to my commissioner to help me okay. out. <laughs> this is the greatest thing because, Chairman Pruitt, um, never have we had kind of a great demonstration of all the projects that we've done in the last couple of years as we do um, the sign right outside the governor's office, and you all probably walk by it all day, um, the background for uh, the exciting news that we had of Georgia being ranked the number one state to do business. Right. Um, and, and I personally love it because it has all of, all of the projects that I had the opportunity to work with the Department of Economic Development. You've got them listed. So you've got the Mohawks um, that are expansions. Um, Representative Chapman, you have Gulfstream that's an expansion, obviously. Um, and you have multiple expansions that are going on because that is 70 to 80 percent of the job creation in Georgia. We have to remember that first. It's existing business. Yes, sir. So it's very important to remember that first and to, um, to understand when it is not competitive, but also to understand when an existing industry um, project location may be competitive with another state and to be able to work with that. Um, but then some other new ones. Um, in the past, you know, the easy ones are the Caterpillars, the Baxters, to, you know, that come to mind. Um, but, of course, some other good locations um, like Ethicon or, um, or Carter's um, headquarters in, um, in Georgia. So um, there's literally a full listing of them right outside of the governor's office. But, um, as you know, we've had a lot of great success in the last couple of years. We have, and, and I appreciate all of those, and we always want to bring up the ones that are major that everybody mm -hmm. knows about. But in rural Georgia, where I live, mm -hmm. and uh, economic development seems to be more in line of drawing businesses in that are larger. But I thought DCA, is, and that's mainly state money, mm -hmm. DCA is more federal money, and I thought it's probably, a, it would be a bigger a contributor to promotion of existing businesses and growth in rural Georgia, mm -hmm. and I know those companies aren't going to be the size that you're talking mm -hmm. about. And when I say rural Georgia, I mean rural Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, down south of Macon, basically. I know there's some rural Georgia and north, north Georgia also. But um, so as we go through this, keep in mind that I, I most everybody here would like to hear the whole program, but I am very interested in what the difference is between economic development's money in your money, and how can we put this to work in a way that will help small businesses and small communities versus, I know we need to go after the big stuff. I mean, it's mm -hmm. important. But when we get 20 jobs in Eastman, Georgia, that's like getting 200 jobs in Atlanta. I agree. I agree. But, okay. And so what you'll hear next is of some of those programs that, um, that we do administer that work on the small ones. Now, I want you to please know that, again, I cannot speak for Commissioner Carr. The way this works is you said economic development's money and your money. This is our money. It's the state of Georgia. We're responsible for it. But it's mostly federal money. No, sir. All, um, all of this. Oh, these things here you're talking about, not, not what we saw earlier. You said 83% was federal money. Yes, sir, and those are. You're right. Yeah. And those do work with small business. But also, please do note that... Um, that when it, we are responsible for those two. So yes, you economic are. development, what they do is they provide the recommendation to DCA, and if we see that it's a good project, okay. we say yes. Um, at the end of the day, at the, um, I had a great opportunity at, at the Department of Economic Development to negotiate the deals, but if, I had, if um, we had then sent a recommendation to DCA and the Department of Community Affairs felt like it was not, um, a, it was not something, it was not worked in the way that it should be, then we would have the ability to say we don't need to do this. It was always very good at economic okay. development. Now we had the checks and balances of DCA. Um, so, but going back into these monies, please do know that I know, having been at the department, that um, we very much take um, 
take rural Georgia very differently. And if there's an opportunity like 20 jobs in Eastman, we're going to be all over it. It doesn't have to be a large number necessarily, sometimes to even fit those dollars. But John, if you'll go on, I think that uh, there's a state small business credit initiative and some others in there that will speak to um, speak to the smaller, smaller. Um, I don't even like the word smaller because like you said, 20 is not small in Eastman, no, is it? No, it's not. Yeah, um, so but, but, and what I love about the federal government is small businesses anywhere under 250 to 500, but we know what that means in yeah. rural Georgia. But, but Commissioner, also the Georgia Main Street program mm -hmm. is through your, through exactly. your organization exactly. as well as Exactly. Exactly. I really appreciate y'all. Actually, y'all are cheering um, more for us than this is exactly what we want to talk about. And I think we need to keep going to the next slide because what we do here uh, a lot, whether it's in the press or at the Capitol, it's about those first two programs, isn't it? Um, and so that's sometimes what everyone thinks. We really want everybody to think about these next programs. So uh, the Community Development Block Grant. Uh, to, to get to your point, Chairman Pruitt, we, we do have a, a lot of federal funds that flow through us to, to local governments, and probably our premier program is the Community Development Block Grant, which is uh, funding that should uh, help low to moderate income persons, and it can be for a wide variety of really community development capacity building type endeavors. It could be water sewer, it could be a senior citizen center. Uh, those things that improve quality of life. Uh, and this past fall, we had our CDBG, annual CDBG awards and gave out 37 and a half million to 79 communities around the state. And I would say predominantly those were rural communities in our state. Uh, which does kind of line up where I think you, you were asking some questions there. There's definitely some resources for that. Uh, similarly, we have the Appalachian Regional Commission up in North Georgia that benefits uh, 37 counties in the ARC service area. Uh, we have 3.7 million that was in the FY14 budget and over the last three years have helped create over 4,000 jobs through that program. Those again are uh, generally rural communities that are targeted with those funds. Go ahead. I know you've got a question. I can hear it coming. I did. Jim, thank you very much. Um, when we talk about job creation, um, who, who validates the actual job creation? Who validates it? Do. Do outside it services that audit and validates that that you know, money's received, jobs supposed, number of jobs to be created, and, and want to actually work. The Department of Community Affairs. We have finance. We have finance specialists in the field that actually continue to do due diligence after we've provided that, so that if for some reason someone doesn't keep up with their promises, that we are able to call back. Okay, and so you you have an enforcement effort there, and if they don't follow through as committed as a callback. Yes, sir. And, and give me an example of a callback. Uh, you know, you say, how do you that? Well, a callback is um, what we are looking for. Obviously, it's very easy. I mean, let's use an easy example. Let's say we have 100 jobs, a $100 million investment. Um, what we what we all know inside um, is that we are asking a company to commit to this. They commit to this. Um, but our callback provision is based on 80%. And so what we are looking for, and I will say that that's an increase because it used to be only 70%. So what we are doing at the end of the day is going out and saying, okay, out of a $100 million investment and 100 jobs, how, many, how much of that did you create? Um, if they meet the 80% threshold or above, um, then we continue going on with them. Um, if, they, um, if they do not fall into that, um, we very much work with them to see, are you going to be able to make it, are you not, and then look at options of clawing back. Have you got an example of a failure to create jobs? Um, to claw back uh, significantly? Or? Actually, we do. We had very interestingly, unfortunately, because it's all unfortunate, is it, sure. isn't it, when sure. it doesn't work, is, um, you know, I, th I think very quickly of range fuels comes to mind. Um, and that was, a large, that was a piece of technology that we really hoped that would work. And it would have been great had it not, but we kind of stepped back and it did not, and so we pulled um, some of those monies back. Stand to candy at Eastman. 
Yes, sir, you're right. Um, standard, can um, standard candy, we provided um, an opportunity and they did not meet the, qual the jobs and investment and we had to um, claw back on those. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Representative Chapman, I have something also very interesting to share with you, if you don't mind, along those lines. If the chairman does it, Mr. Um, chairman. We're here to listen and learn. Um, something that it, we take it with, with great, you know, a, we with heavy hearts that this is a huge responsibility, um, whether here at DCA or at economic development in the negotiations. And um, recently at, um, in the mix of all this, and we work together, you know, they call and say, what do you think and is this going to work? Um, recently there was a company that we knew if they do what they say they're going to do is going to be incredible for Georgia and specifically for a rural community um, but sometimes things sound a little too good to be true don't they um, and it was a situation where we thought this sounds too good to be true but if it is true then we don't want to lose out and for one of the first times we put together an agreement that said if you create so many jobs and so many investment. At that time, we will provide you with the incentive. And um, we're excited about that. Um, we felt it was appropriate, and so I bring that to you to let you know that we are always watching those opportunities to be created. Thank you. I'll, I'll mention a few more of our community economic development programs. One is our Main Street and Downtown Development, as, as you had mentioned. We have 96 Main Street communities in the state, uh, and the, the focus there is on uh, helping to build and maintain uh, healthy, vibrant downtowns, uh, since they engender not only job creation and growth, but also a sense of place. Uh, and it's a very popular program at, at DCA. Um, we also have uh, a few others here that you may not be as familiar with. The AmeriCorps program, which is volunteerism, uh, is, is housed at DCA. The, we have the honor of staffing the Martin Luther King Jr. Advisory Council at DCA. Uh, we also staff the Georgia Rural Development Council that looks at rural policy issues uh, and provides advice to the department uh, and the Georgia Academy for Economic Development which provides training opportunities throughout the state for local elected officials uh, on economic development. That's, that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, how, how many of the rural counties and cities are using we have uh, one of these classes in every one of the 12 service delivery regions annually. Isn't that yes. right, Commissioner? Are you talking about the academy, Mr. Chairman? Well, I'm just looking at the other academy and then okay. the Rural Development Council. Mm -hmm. um, AmeriCorps, so I, is that confined to the metro area? No, sir. AmeriCorps, this is the most interesting thing to me, provides for the funding of the volunteer teachers um, on Jekyll Island for the sea turtles. There are teachers and there are also um, their college age um, students that, who come and they, um, they, they man the, um, the Jekyll, the Turtle Center. And I was amazed to know that that's an AmeriCorps program. Um, so the majority of these, with the exception of the Martin Luther King Advisory Council, are the rural pieces. The great thing about the Martin Luther King Advisory Council is that is the exact reason it was started. Um, because everyone felt like we do a great event in Atlanta, but we don't necessarily, and maybe some smaller tier cities, but we don't necessarily get out in the state um, and celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday as we should. And so that's something that that council is doing. The Georgia Academy for Economic Development goes on and on and on and on um, to get to the next, to the next leader. Um, and basically we have, um, we have obviously 12 regions throughout the state. And so these academies are taking place in the fall and the spring and um, they have been going on now, Nikki, for how many years? 20 plus years. Um, and for any of you who have not um, gone through the academy, we would love for you to join us. How do you enroll? You just sign up. Right. I'll, I'll sign you up to, when we get back to the office. Sign, up, like. and, and sign up our whole committee. Okay, we'd love to. Thank and, you. And where, and where are the regions? Uh, 
The state service delivery regions, actually these are, um, this is a small photograph, but these are the 12 regions um, that have been determined by the state and um, we follow through in each region. Um, and the way that we, we recruit individuals um, are through the local chambers, the development authorities, the local governments, and um, our regional reps that are out in the field um, are working on those programs to recruit individuals and to take them through the program. Can you talk about Yes, sir. Um, AmeriCorps is an organization um, that, as you know, that is all federal funds, right? And basically the purpose is to make sure that volunteerism is taking place, um, that um, teaching um, in the schools are taking place on a volunteer basis. And what it really is is the ability to take federal monies um, to provide for funding for those volunteer activities to take place. Um, there is a there is a advisory board um, that because of federal regulations that we have within AmeriCorps. And so we have local, for instance, um, Representative Rogers, we were talking about Berry College. You have the Bonner Scholar, um, the, the individual responsible for the Bonner Scholars at Berry College on that board. We have different board members um, that are making sure that we are putting our volunteer dollars throughout Georgia um, in, in a correct manner. We can follow up with more information on the specific programs if you would like. Well, I'll go back again to the, uh, the question is that where are these different, uh, you mentioned down in Tybee and I guess probably in Savannah mm -hmm. and those areas, but is there anything in the, in the rural area that's available for um, I believe program? so. Do you know? I don't know um, off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm sure we could come up with their, their most recent funding round yes, and what all uh, the, was the awarded. I think a lot of the problem is in the rural areas is that we don't know what's available, therefore we don't apply for it. And that's kind of why this meeting is set up today. And I'm not blaming anybody. No, I'm no, just, no, no. We feel the same exact way. We agree with you. And we've got to do a better job. And I think if we can educate the legislators and then we whether we should or not take credit for bringing it in there, we'll probably work on a little harder. We but. absolutely agree with you. Um, and whenever I, I looked over to Nikki because we are literally working on something at this point where we could provide more assistance in that way. We feel okay. like of these, when you look at economic development financing, we have 24 programs. And we feel like we hear about two, Reba and Edge, right? And we want to hear about the 22 all the time, and so we're we are trying to do that more. Well, I want to give you, a, for instance, I'm I'm real close with Arthur Blank Foundation. Yes, sir. And uh, I called the other day because our, our rec recreation department had an mm -hmm. opportunity to buy adjacent land to mm -hmm. the park which they needed, and this bank repoed, and they were going to sell it to them at a really really good price, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the money. So I called and asked him. They said, no, we just do sports equipment and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. she, he said, but I suggest you go to one of your other foundations. We don't have foundations where mm -hmm. we live. I understand. I mean, they're just not there. And, of course, I'm going to start paying a little bit more attention changing the subject, but we came out uh, last year and put money in the budgets for libraries to put new roofs on and air conditioning and all that. But it's 50-50 match. Well, 50-50 matches in Atlanta is one thing. A 50-50 mm -hmm. match in a town... I've got five counties. The largest town is 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. You just can't come up with it. Mm -hmm. So I love the tier system, and I think we need to start using it in other ways mm -hmm. other than just the way it's being used current. Uh, Representative Pruitt, one of the things, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I have noticed, um, as you know, I was responsible at one time for the, um, the regional program at the Department of Economic Development. Right. Um, we were very good at somehow when, when the budget started, um, declining to make sure we always kept our field staff present in every 12 regions. Um, and we even have, and we decided, we figured out that we couldn't do with only one in Atlanta. In Metro Atlanta, we have two because they couldn't cover it. All right. Because we are all one individual with 24 hours and, you know, and seven day week. And so um, economic development kept up with that. The Department of Community Affairs um, did not, um, through reductions in force, we took our, um, a lot of our regional managers and combined different regions, and we have them in, in, in many regions. And what we have found is if you're someone who lives in Statesboro and you're supposed to cover the entire coast and you're supposed to go up into Region 7, you're not going to get there, no matter how good of a job you do. And so um, that's one of the things that we're discussing now because we feel that um, we say economic development financing, but that's downtown development. Those are 
regional Appalachian Regional Commissions. Those are incentive employment programs. These are CDBGs. These are the basics of getting a community ready. Um, and we feel like we haven't been able to actually go talk to the local city manager or the county manager and say, do you know of these programs and how can we help you apply along with the regional commission's assistance? Well, I actually get two reports, one from our RDC down in, mm -hmm. well, it is located in Eastman, the headquarters. Then the other one is, uh, I guess, Warner Robins. And I look at the reports from both, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely amazing. But I know they only do based on request. Mm -hmm. And it makes me feel like looking at those two reports that we're just not getting the interest in the district in that part of my district mm -hmm. as we do in Pulaski County yes, sir. and and up to Warner Robins. But. And a lot of it, you know, you again, some of it's about projects coming in, but it's not all, that's two programs out of those 24, right? The other 22 should yeah. be talking about local leadership. Right. What do we want to do in our downtowns? What do we want to do with our water? What do we want to do with our sewer? And those are not economic development projects. Um, those are the basics of community infrastructure, and that's what we want to do better for Well, you. I can tell you, if you go to my city, any of my cities in my district, if you ask them what a CDBG grant is, mm -hmm. it's water and sewer. That's all they know, yes. it's water and sewer. Yeah. But there's stuff outside of water and sewer, is there not? There is. There are items outside of water and sewer, but I will tell you that what I have found, because I very quickly got in to look at the um, community development block grants to say, what else can we do with it, knowing that a lot of it was water and sewer? When you start looking through the applications of the water and sewer, you see why we fund them. And okay. we fund them because these are dire applications of individuals, um, communities that don't have the, the appropriate water or the appropriate sewer. And so it's the basics. Um, but do we want to look at another program to see can we use, again, downtown development for, um, you know, to do more with a with a uh, with a small business loan or do we want to do the state small business credit initiative where we can literally um, join with banks in making small business loans and more and more I think I've okay <laughs> thank I've you been... I can see we're not going to cover all this today <laughs> hey, did you come down to Eastman seven eight years ago when I had that program I thought you did and, and it was amazing to me I had people standing in the room from both economic development and DCA and and after somebody said, well, we do this, and other, uh, other employees said, I didn't know we did that. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me realize this is pretty complicated and it's a lot to absorb. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to shift focus just a little bit. You know, the commissioner had talked about our three core businesses being community and economic development, local government assistance, and safe and affordable housing. So I'm going to talk about a few of what we call our local government assistance programs. Uh, comprehensive planning is at the top of that list. Uh, cities and counties uh, are asked to do a 10-year plan and submit that uh, through their regional commission up to the Department of Community Affairs, and then they're asked to do a five-year update. Uh, and this simply lays out uh, how that city or county plans to grow uh, and plans for their future. And DCA uh, reviews those plans to make sure they meet some minimum requirements. We also, yes sir. How many are submitting those plans? Um, most do. Um, it's, it's technically, it's not a legal requirement that they submit them. However, to be eligible for state grant and loan programs, uh, they'll need to meet certain minimum requirements in terms of submitting those comprehensive plans. But, uh, we can we can let you know what kind of compliance rate we have with that currently. Okay. Yes, re regional commissions will uh, will help, and we recently went through a, a process of trying to make particularly what we call our short-term work program, those five-year updates, making those easier and more clear. And so, hopefully, there are things that the city and county will find very helpful to do, and not just a paper exercise. Uh, but certainly we're glad to help at DCA uh, with any city and county who, who need some assistance and regional commissions can also help with that process. I, I appreciate that question, Representative Jackson, because one of the things I hear is that we can't afford a grant writer. And that's what's really getting all these cities the grants is because they've got grant writers and we can't afford to have one. No. Look out now. I just... Look, I was skinning rabbits last weekend. What was you doing? 
He was chasing coons on the new ad. Representative uh, Allison Bill. He was Bill. pinning them up. Yeah. Representative Pruitt, I, yes, I, I, oh, excuse me. I agree with that in some instances. and in others, remember a lot of those those federal grants and such. There are um, sometimes there are administration fees where those grant writers are able to come in, and we can use those administration fees for those. So that's another reason. Anytime well, you have that question, put them in contact. Do you have a list of grant writers that we could even call on? Yes, sir. Okay, definitely. that'd be wonderful. No, I'm sorry, we don't. No, go ahead. Where is it, Williams? All right, no. we'll get even later. Uh, we will. Uh, Mr. Corbin. Yes, sir. Thank you, and uh, congratulations. Going back to America, where, uh, approximately how much money uh, of federal drawdown money that you have in the VA? Do you know how much money? Not a lot. Just a lot. Yeah. 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 I, I want to say it's about seven, between six and seven million a year mm -hmm. is about the amount of money. Now, the Dr. King, our counselor, is that on the state or is that on the federal state? It is. It is. That yes, sir. No, I don't need really, I don't, I don't. Actually, and there's there's no money attached there's to that? No yeah, so. Funded through what? Right. So, DCA and any. Uh, any money we need through that, DCA has found a way to come up with that. So we staff that council, um, and but there was no money attached to to that council. Yeah. Yes, sir. And so we'd love some additional sponsorships. <laughs> maybe we can sell a rabbit. <laughs> or the maybe just a hide. <laughs> but you know we do consider that an honor. We consider yeah. it an honor, and it always works out. Thank you, John. Go ahead. Um, construction codes and industrialized buildings. Uh, our staff is responsible for updating the state's minimum construction codes, and these are the codes that then local governments can adopt and use. Uh, we set the minimum standards, and then local governments can always go above those standards, but we set the minimum through DCA. You talk about building codes? Building codes, yes, sir. The first yes, thing sir. I signed was a carbon monoxide report. You'll probably remember that we had a um, Finch Middle School or High School. Yeah, I remember that. Um, had, yeah. had some issues, and the first thing I signed as commissioner was a, a study on carbon, or on carbon monoxide and how to, um, how to make sure that a situation like that didn't happen in our s schools. So where is that right now? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out where is it at right now. So Ted actually had a full group. How many individuals were on the study committee? Yeah, 21 people. We came up with a set of voluntary guidelines that we distributed throughout the state to uh, our department, and the uh, safety fire marshal, and the uh, education department. So are you man mandating carbon monoxide detectors? No. We come up with a set of guidelines for each school to go through and look at their school and then make their decision on their own merits. If they feel they should, there's a uh, standard that they should use. In other words, they don't, if they got heat pumps instead of gas, they don't really need carbon exactly. monoxide detectors? Okay. So we can't? We don't have to worry about superintendents talking about Department of Community Affairs mandating down to local school boards. That's correct. We've given them the tools good. to determine for themselves. That's good, because I've heard enough of that lately. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's mm -hmm. great. Uh, service delivery strategies. Uh, you know, the, there was a law passed uh, back several years ago that required counties and cities uh, to mm -hmm. Uh, come up with an agreement on who is going to deliver what services mm -hmm. and DCA administers that process and we also get involved if there's ever an instance where cities and counties can't agree they can come to us we go through uh, a process to help them with mediation of those issues. What about SPLOS? You'll get involved in the distrib distribution of SPLOS? We do not. That's, okay. really, that's a Department of Revenue okay. issue. Yes, sir. Um, Regional technical assistance, as the commissioner was talking about the fact that we, we have uh, staff out in the regions in the field, uh, their job is to know the needs of local governments and to know the resources that DCA has and then try to marry those things up. And that's where I think the commissioner was saying uh, it'd be great if we had a few more resources in the field to do that job. 
<clears throat> and then we also have a group that is our research group. Uh, they, they do survey local governments to gather information. That information can be everything from how their finances are handled to their operations. Uh, we do a hotel motel tax survey as well. And then uh, that information is available. Uh, we have a lot of the universities who will take advantage of it. We occasionally have folks from the General Assembly who will call us and ask us about information related to that. Our research group also handles the fiscal notes. Y'all may know if, if a bill is proposed and it's going to have an impact on local governments, then a fiscal note has to accompany it. DCA does And DCA that. does I fiscal I thought our notes. budget office did it. Local government. Yeah. Oh, on local government. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, regional technical assistance, uh, you said you need additional. Yes. How many is additional? I would like to take it to 13. We have five now, so, um, so eight finance specialists in the field. And what, what's the average cost of um, that? The average cost when you look at the salaries, the operations, and the marketing to go along with it is $1.4 million. Did you turn in for that this yes, year? Sir. Yes, sir, I did. And I will tell you, um, when we started talking about the budget um, with the governor's office, um, Teresa and I both said, you know, this is something, this would be great, but we can kind of wait. Um, and then a couple of projects came up where I realized we shouldn't have, that should not have happened. <laughs> okay. That should have never happened. We shouldn't have, we, we shouldn't have, you know, we shouldn't have promised that when we didn't have it to promise, and we should have taken care of something else that we didn't take care of. And I raised my hand and said, please, and so um, the governor's office was very good to say go ahead in the middle, even after your house budget was passed. And so um, we have talked with the Senate leadership, and they've right. been kind to consider it. And so I hope that you'll see them. Call now, will this be all state money here? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. And something, again, that I, that I think that we'll need to look at in the next five to ten years is really a plan for DCA in regards to um, what state funding do we want to have at DCA and what state funding do we not want to have at DCA in regards to operations. Is it because of matching funds? I mean, is that... You got to determine if those matching funds are really worth us getting. Are we really utilizing them for reasons that benefit Georgia it's and really, make and create That's really jobs? not the reason. What I have found okay. is that is do, that is going very well. Um, the, these deputies okay. have made sure we're matching very well. But the question really has been through um, through the tough budget times um, when we had budget cuts, we would do as much as we could, but. Um, we also sometimes would say, okay, this is maybe an individual who's doing 30% state, 70% federal, and we would kind of patch the hole with the federal dollars. And so now as the federal budget goes down, if it does, and the state goes up, I think we need to make sure that we don't lose okay. because the state, because we're working more on federal. Very good. You say you have five right now? We only have five, and what we are trying to do with those five individuals is those are our finance specialists. Those finance specialists are trying to keep up with the um, Department of Economic Development salespeople. When well, that's, that was going to be my question. Department of Economic Development have salespeople in I don't yes, know what, how many regions they have. They have 12 and they have 13. And so their job is to follow the project and then come to you if the project it seems to have some merit, and then you decide whether or not you want to fund it and what avenue to fund it. Yes, sir. So Economic Development doesn't have any funds at all other than the discretionary funds of some sort, I guess, that's set aside by the governor for Deal closings, That's is correct. that? Okay. And so they're doing the sales and marketing, and they'll go into an Eastman. What, is it not possible to combine those two jobs? Well, they do a really good job at, at providing the most information that they can for it, um, and they do a good job at that. But at the end of the day, when you've got 24 financing programs, it's my, okay. our individual's responsibility to know not just that it's possible or it's available, but to know the insides and the outsides of um, can I do an EIP on public and private funding? Um, can I, you know, can I do a CDBG here or can I do this? Yeah. And to know, to know those 150 federal guidelines that have to come behind them so that economic development can then go to the next piece. Um, it's also what I have found interesting is that um, the finance specialist not only says, okay, this might be an opportunity for a city and county, um, but, and also it's not just the economic development, it's also that downtown development financing it's the, um, it's the basic infrastructure before you ever see a project. It's working with that local city and county manager. Um, but then it's also once we, have, once we have applied for something and we've received these funds, 
um, um, Representative Chapman, it goes back to the kind of the compliance and making sure that those same individuals are out there to say, are, are these monies being used correctly? Because today, tomorrow's funds really are dependent on that we use today's and yesterday's funds in a, in a proper manner. Do you have funding through the federal government that doesn't get distributed from year to year? No, sir. So even if we're if we put more people in the field and we'd attract more businesses, it's just a matter of having narrowing it down to a better quality place to put it. Because if you don't have any more dollars and you're spending them all, mm -hmm. do we really need more people out mm -hmm. doing this? Mm -hmm. I guess is that's a very good question. But yes, and the reason is we want to make sure that we're using those fundings in the right manner. Um, the the two piece two situations that I gave you, um, they were not being used correctly because, or they were being proposed not to be used correctly um, because we had um, we had a local official that was trying their best um, to do a really good job, but we didn't have someone sitting at the table or someone that was available to provide them with that information. Um, what we have found is, I, I very quickly answered the question of no, you know, we're using our, but what I have found is if there are additional opportunities, for instance, the Appalachian Regional Commission, and this is North Georgia, but um, there are opportunities to receive additional federal fundings if there is a need. Um, I just came back from D.C. I was in D.C. yesterday with the Appalachian Regional Commission, and we have a certain amount that they provide us, but if we can, if we can find much better projects and we mm -hmm. can go to them, we can bring additional funding in. Okay, thank you. Well, I was going to move to the housing programs, and I think Carmen's going to speak to that. Okay. Thank you, John. Sure. Thank you, John. Thank you. Carmen, welcome. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your time this afternoon. I'll start out really um, to follow up on what the commissioner said about the housing programs. We provide housing opportunities really through funding, financing, and incentives. Um, DCA or the state through DCA does not own any housing or manage any housing directly. So we have financing programs, funding programs, and incentive programs. And I'll start by talking about the Georgia Dream Home Ownership Program. That is our mortgage program that we provide um, financing for first-time home buyers to purchase their homes. And we do that program through a network of banks, private sector lenders and mortgage companies throughout the state. There are 70 lenders with over 300 branches throughout Georgia. Um, individuals who qualify can also get assistance with down payment, uh, down payment and closing costs. But anybody who takes advantage of the down payment also is required to have housing counseling. So they work with someone on understanding the responsibilities of home ownership, the financial responsibilities of the mortgage, as well as um, maintaining the property. And if they get in trouble, we have um, foreclosure prevention counseling as well. Sure. How do the guidelines pertaining to mortgage compare to the standard guidelines for obtaining mortgage? Okay, we we have um, really two sets of guidelines. The first I'll talk about are um, guidelines because we issue tax exempt mortgage revenue bonds. The um, mortgagors have to meet certain criteria. They have to be a first-time home buyer. They have to have uh, no more than a certain income. They have to purchase a home that costs no more than a certain amount. So those are the compliance requirements. But we also have credit requirements. And those are generally um, standard industry credit requirements because all of our loans are either insured or guaranteed. Um, predominantly, ours are insured um, by the Federal Housing Administration or FHA. So, um, you know, in, in the case where there's a default, we have a, a mortgage insurance guarantee to back that up. Um, but they have traditional um, underwriting requirements um, for credit. I'm sorry. Uh, so, you know, how many Georgians have taken, taken advantage of? That's a good question. We, we serve about 1,400. Um, first-time home buyers every year, and those are really spread out throughout the state, um, maybe about 40% in the metro area, 
and about 60% outside of the metropolitan Atlanta area. But generally it's between 14 and 1,500 uh, households every year. I mean, do you have like 1,500 apply and 1,500 get it? Well, everybody, we have what we call a continuous funding program. So all eligible home buyers are able to receive financing through our program. We haven't gotten to a point where we could not honor a financing request because we consistently um, maintain our funding in the bond market and we access more resources to continuously fund the program. So it is not a situation where eligible homeowners are turned away because we don't have the resources. How long has the program been going on? We've been doing it since 1976. You say so you'd like to do our interest rate right now is four and a quarter percent, but that also includes down payment assistance. So there's a, a zero percent deferred down payment loan that's not you don't have to make payments on until you sell, transfer, or refinance the property. And then when that property is sold or transferred, we get that down payment assistance back and we recycle it to help other homeowners. Yeah, we, we measure our default rate against the FHA uh, default rates in the state of Georgia because that's the most comparable um, category to measure ourselves against. And we are consistently, both in terms of delinquency and foreclosure, our foreclosure rate is about half the state's average as it compares to other FHA loans. And we believe that's attributable to the down payment assistance that we provide and the counseling, yes. And we service loans in-house, so we're able to work with homeowners to help them maintain their homes. Just out of curiosity, do you track in any form or fashion how many people have sold those homes and, go, and then step up to a traditional mortgage or something like that? Well, we, we, interesting to know. Yeah, we, don't, we don't generally know what they're doing when they pay off the loan. Um, sometimes we can tell it's a refinance just from interacting with the title company or something like that. Um, but we believe in most cases that is the case, that people are buying another home and, and stepping up when they sell their Georgia Dream home. Is, is this typical um, market insurance? It's not, is it federally funded insurance? I mean, it, are you buying the insurance through taxpayers, I guess is what I'm saying, or are you buying it through a conventional way? Well, right now we're not um, doing any conventional insured loans because as a result of the housing crisis, a lot of those um, con private insurance companies are not viable, but when they were viable, they were an option for our home buyers. So they could choose to do an FHA loan, which is insured by the insurance provided by the federal government, or they could get a private insurance company like a General Electric mortgage insurance or something like that. How do you market the program? We have um, a team of housing staff that is in the field um, that markets primarily to lenders because when an individual is interested in purchasing a home, they go to their mortgage lender um, to get pre-qualified or to real estate agents. So we market to lenders, real estate agents. We have a network of housing counseling agencies throughout the state, so they are always uh, aware of our programs, and we market to local governments. Why would a local bank want to get involved in this? It's an opportunity for a local bank to have what we call a secondary market for the loans that they make. These are loans that if they agree to meet our requirements as far as who they lend to, um, we will purchase that loan from that bank as a secondary market so they don't have to sell it to Fannie Mae or mm -hmm. Freddie Mac. We'll purchase that loan and hold it in our portfolio. Have so, you, you've got any kind of record of the demographics of where these homes are? in Georgia? Yeah. Um, we have served every county in the state in, in our tenure over 30 years, but um, about 40 to 45 percent are in the metro area. And I can... Now, you, can you, you gave us that number. I'd mm -hmm. really like to see it on a map. Yeah, we can definitely okay. provide that, yes. Okay.
We don't uh, limit or have any restrictions about the age of the home. There are some things that have to happen if a property is built before 1978, then they have to make sure it doesn't have lead-based paint and things like that. But as long as it meets the standard uh, lenders, uh, industry guidelines, and the mortgage insurer, we would finance that home. The next program I want to talk to you about is Home Safe Georgia. And this is a relatively new program. It's federally funded and it's a result of the housing crisis when Georgia and many other states had record high unemployment and high foreclosures. We uh, received funding from the Treasury Department to implement a program called Home Safe Georgia. It comes from the hardest hit fund. And um, originally, our program was targeted to individuals who were unemployed or underemployed through no fault of their own. They lost their job or became, became underemployed due to the economy and were unable to make their mortgage payments. So it was a mortgage payment assistance program where we worked in, con in concert with their mortgage company to pay a portion of their mortgage while they sought work or worked part time. Um, we recently made some program changes that were implemented on February 1st. We believe that will expand the pool of eligible applicants for the program. Uh, again, initially we were targeting only unemployed and underemployed. This allows us to um, target hardships that are not related specifically to employment. So there may be medical hardships or people who um, have reduced income as a, re as a result of military service or disability. And we would look to achieve a long-term sustainable mortgage payment for that particular homeowner. Um, we have been able to help 4,700 individuals uh, with the program since 2011 and we've served people in 121 counties and you can believe we're always looking at the map where we haven't served anyone to determine if there's a need if we just need to market or do more outreach or if you know the program is just not um, something that that community needs to access but um, we've implement we've used about 91 million in funding which represents 31 percent of the funding available in that program we do think with the program changes that we implemented and working with our partners um, we'll use all those funds by the deadline which is December 2017. Are, are legislators eligible since we're not making any money while we're <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to look at that on an individual I basis. Think, I, just think, I just think there's something we can add to it. Let's think about it. Yeah. 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 339 million. And anything you can do, all of you, to help us get the word out, because this is what I have figured out about this program, is this is not our typical housing client. This is not someone who's looking for their first time with the, with, um, with the Georgia Dream Program. It's not someone who's looking for rental assistance. This is you and me who may have lost a, their income, may have had a medical hardship, um, this is this is our friends and our family members who are not used to looking out for assistance and anything yep. that you can do to help us market this program, we would appreciate. I think, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I had this conversation with the bank. Mm -hmm. I was on the bank board, and there were people just couldn't make their payments yes. because a lot of, and I didn't realize hardship had been added. Mm -hmm. And, I, and these are good people who had good incomes, mm -hmm. but for no fault of their own, all of a sudden now they can't make the payment. Mm -hmm. My bank is unaware. So how do you market? Do you go to the banks or the local banks? Do you go? Who do you who do you try? Well, to we we get. Um, we've been targeting primarily um, Department of Labor, career centers, and unemployment um, offices people, and workforce development. We, we also work with the servicer because the, the interesting thing is the servicer has to agree to accept payments from us rather than the right. mortgage or a loan. Um, so we've targeted um, our marketing to banks, right. lenders, servicers. But if there's one in particular, we can certainly have staff um, meet with them uh, to talk about is the program. Is the paperwork a nightmare? Because that's another thing. Yes. Well, it is. It's, it's documentation that would be similar to a loan modification or 
getting a new loan, we do have to make sure individuals are eligible and meet all of the requirements. So we have to make sure they are, um, you know, whatever the hardship is, that we properly document that so that we don't ha provide assistance to someone who's not eligible. So you have a Home Safe Georgia map there? We do. Okay. So just to, to answer that, we would be more than happy to, to sit down with you or anybody in those counties to talk about how we can reach homeowners in those counties. But Okay. Okay. And Chairman Pruitt, I think a lot of it does have to do with the banks because, for instance, we have SunTrust who calls us and says, will you go do an event with us? Yeah. But my dad's bank in Polk County does not know about this, right? And at the end of the day, this money goes towards the lender to save those loans. Um, something that we want to make sure that we are doing well is the Georgia Bankers Association, the Community Bankers Association that's going to be working with these small banks to make sure they know about it. But then there's also, we've got to be realistic about this. Um, we also have to, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for saying that you were good with this. We also have to have the local bankers um, being comfortable with knowing that their dollars are matched up with federal dollars as well. And that's something, anything that you can help us to do in our messaging and marketing. We well, I'm just going to, and it's not all your fault because uh, this past, uh, year before last, I brought Brian Williamson down, which is a guy I think a lot of. And to introduce a program that you had that I, you're probably going to get to in a few minutes maybe that you haven't discussed yet. And I invited by email, by letter, and by phone call, every banker in my district, and one showed up. And they did, and then when I got Brian in front of the bankers, they just said, oh, "This is just too much work." And they, but so you can't, you can't make them do it. But the housing thing is, a, I think, a little bit different than that other program we were talking about. Now I understand it's been, the paperwork's been changed. I don't even know the name of it. But the paperwork's been changed on it to make it not quite as difficult. So I want to go back and revisit that again with the bankers. But it. As you educate us, it's, it's, no, it's a networking thing. You know, when we hear people, and who's going to hear about it first, but the legislators are when people need assistance. Pastors need to know it. Pastors hear it first. So, exactly. so we, we can help you get the word out if we know what the word is. So this may not be the only meeting we have if you have time to meet with us again. We would love it because you just mentioned you were referring to the state small business credit initiative. I was. And I don't think we hit on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, y'all skipped y'all skip right over that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. I like the fact that you're doing the housing counseling because we um, have a plan where you give some of these uh, applicants and say, okay, you need to uh, make a look at how you find how you finance this sort of thing. The man. You don't need there's some buzzing down here. Brand new state rent or you know house furniture mm -hmm. and things like that. Do you give these people a mm print -hmm. out to let them see? Yes, we do. We do. It's a very extensive um, workbook that we go through. We provide the um, counseling either in person or one-on-one um, -on -one or in a group setting. We do also have the availability to do it online, which you may think, well, then they can just skip through it. But it, the way we work that with the vendor is it requires tests that they have to pass along the way. And that was really to make it accessible in all areas of the state. But yes, the, re, um, the workbook that is used for those trainings is very extensive. Okay. And, and you know, DeKalb County and Gwinnett County are two of the highest counties as far as um, um, funding under the Home Safe Program, and they have the highest it's rates of foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Train, you got a meeting in this room coming yeah, up? Okay. We fix it. We've, we've got three minutes. <laughs> Okay, I'll go through um, quickly, but if, if you want me to stop anywhere, please let me know. The next program is the Community Home Investment Program. You'll hear us refer to it as CHIP, and that's really a program that provides 
housing resources to local governments, nonprofits, and public housing authorities to work directly in the particular community. So um, we see mostly housing rehab done under that program where homeowners own their homes, but they don't meet what we call housing quality standards and they need rehabilitation. So we provide the um, the grant to the local government or nonprofit or public housing authority and then they provide the assistance to the homeowner. The next program is the housing tax credit program and you may have heard of this. Um, it is really the incentive program that we have. It's a federal tax credit um, that is provided to developers of affordable rental housing and the tax credit is leveraged with private equity and other resources, either private resources or um, federal resources, uh, to build and develop affordable rental housing. In return for the tax credit, the owner agrees to rent the units at two individuals making 60% of the area median income in that particular community, and they agree to those restrictions for 30 years. Um, you'll hear we, we do a 15-year period and a second 15-year period, um, but this is really the primary uh, tool for the development of affordable rental housing in the state. The next program is the rental assistance program, uh, rental assistance through our housing choice voucher program. You may have heard of it as Section 8. We, we don't call it that anymore, but that's what uh, people know it as. But those are HUD funds that provide assistance to very low income families, elderly individuals, and individuals with disabilities. We've used these resources to help individuals with disabilities um, who are transitioning from state hospitals so that they can live in the most integrated setting appropriate to their needs. So that's really been something we've been able to do through the Housing Choice Voucher Program over the last year. Um, the GeorgiaHousingSearch.org is an online directory that we um, support that provides um, a resource of affordable housing that's available in local communities. So wherever you are, you can go to georgiahousingsearch.org and search for an affordable rental unit. Um, the next program is the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing. That is a three-year program where we work directly with local communities um, in a retreat setting to help them develop and implement a housing plan. We have at any given time 15 communities involved at different stages. We bring in five communities a year for three years and they interact twice a year in facilitated retreats where we bring technical assistance either for resources from DCA or other resources that would meet their needs and this is done in partnership uh, with UGA and the Georgia Municipal Association. And then I want to mention our homeless assistance programs. Those are primarily federally funded, um, but we do administer the State Housing Trust Fund for the Homeless Commission. It's one of the areas that we do receive state funding to leverage and match federal dollars. And with those resources, um, we implement um, programs to serve homeless individuals, really from uh, shelters all the way to permanent housing. Our emphasis is on long-term sustainable outcomes for individuals who access these programs. So we do a lot of research and best practice implementation around that funding. And that's it. I'll be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think, like I said, we, it's like getting a drink of water from a fire hydrant, but we have really been impressed. I have. I, don't, I think everybody would agree with me that there's just so much out there that we need to help you get the word out. If we really want to help our communities, we need to learn a little bit more about this, and I appreciate you, Commissioner, taking your time to come, and, and we'll just have to set up another session later because there's other people wanting to use the room. Plus, I've absorbed all about it. I can absorb, I think, today. <laughs> yes. But thank you so much. Are there any questions before we adjourn? One quick comment. I had the pleasure of chairing a uh, better hometown board yeah. that worked very close with uh, the Department of Community Affairs. I have to tell you, the level of professionalism and the, and, and the 
level of commitment is amazing. I just commend your entire organization. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you very much for hosting us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming.